I guess to put it this way, whether or not an IRA holder commits a prohibited transaction is entirely their responsibility. So we don't take responsibility for that because it's self-directed and they're making these decisions and we can't control the decisions that they make. But we do, you know, talk to them and say and tell and teach them. Welcome back to the show. Disruptions. I'm your host, Aaron Hale, and this is Point of Impact. Today's special guest is Karn Hall, founder and CEO of UDirect IRA Services. And the reason I've got her on is because, well, an embarrassingly short time ago, I really had no idea about financial literacy and uh, investing for my future. But when I decided that I was going to take uh, the future into my own hands, I started learning about IRAs, uh, IRS's uh, individual retirement arrangements. And these are the agreements between an individual and the IRS that says that if you invest in these, in these you know, retirement vehicles, you can pay less to them. And it's an incentive in uh, uh, ways to save for your future so the the government doesn't have to pay for you. Anyways, to stay on track here, I started learning about what the rules were for a traditional versus Roth IRA, 401k. And since I was a a self-employed or, you know, a small business owner, I found out as I continue to pull the thread that there are other IRAs such as SEPs, simple solo 401ks for anybody that has a 1099 or is a consultant, contractor, uh, or just earns money from a side hustle. You can invest in these various types of tax shelters. And, uh, as uh, as I continued to learn and find out more about this, uh, I kind of geeked out a little bit because you know keeping more of what I earn is very important to me now. But what truly blew my mind was when I started investing in real estate and people were talking about self directed IRAs, SDIRA, and. I found out that you can invest in far more than, you know, a ticker symbol in the alphabet soup uh, from your local, you know, your big box, you know, big box uh, brokerage or banks. And you can invest in more than stocks, bonds, mutual funds. In fact, just about anything except, say, collectibles. You can write a check and, you know, you finance someone else's fix and flip project. You can buy, you, you invest in somebody else's, uh, or you can buy, invest in your own pizza joint or tax liens, tax notes, or gosh, yeah, syndicate together with other operators to uh, invest in apartment buildings. There is almost no limit to what you can invest in. And that's why I've got Karn on today. As the CEO of UDirect, she helps others learn about, you know, the do's and don'ts of self-directed IRAs. And uh, UDirect is in a, a self-directed IRA custodian. So she'll explain the difference between what brokers and banks uh, can and can't do and what custodians can and can't do. And of course, what self-directed IRAs are and what their freedoms and restrictions are. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll get as much of an education out of it as I did. And I hope you enjoy. Without further ado, Karen Hall. Welcome to Point and Pack Car. Oh my goodness, I've already started. Uh, welcome to Point of Impact Car. <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, different 
great to have you on the show. Uh, I'm glad this way the introduction because, you know, I remember listening to you. Uh, it was on the Gino show uh, a little while back. And then, of course, I took as well because uh, they uh, you need today. And I thought because my voiceover was not so handled them differently. I saw, like, I'm sure many do. It was a title. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a great one. I stand out and out just a little bit. Uh, but uh, what was even more memorable was your presentation. And in Cinematic IRS, and you was, you know, um, you run, and you are subtracted by our exploding. And I, like many Americans, uh, have no idea, I have no idea what is directed IRA. When I first learned it, blew my mind. Why don't more people know about this? I know, why don't they? I think it's because uh, people have their jobs and they're working and they're not really thinking maybe about their retirement as much as they as may, as they might, and so a lot of people like to invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, uh, and not really think about it, kind of set it and forget it. But self directed IRAs have been around for gosh, you know, almost fifty years. Well, how about we start to go? What are self directed IRAs? Right. Well, I think you know what an IRA is. It's an individual retirement arrangement, and it was formed again fifty years ago. And ever since IRAs existed in 1975, you've been able to invest in really anything um, except life insurance contracts and collectibles. So what makes it self-directed is that the assets that go into the plan are not tied to the stock market. They're non-market correlated. So it's alternative assets. So if you want to invest in market correlated assets, that's when you go to a broker dealer. But if you want to invest in assets like real estate or notes or cryptocurrency, precious metals, things like this, you use a self-directed IRA that lets you take those retirement dollars, invest in these assets, and have the proceeds um, be tax-free or tax-deferred. So, if the self-directed IRA is self-free, I mean, the ability to invest, if I look at the IRS code a nerd like that, and then touch some investments, like, like new men, things like marine loans, I had no idea what that was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but why can't I go to, say, Schwab Fidelity and look up, so I know I'm called for. Uh, uh, why can't I do that with a broker engine? That's a gun laid as What's the difference between, say, a subject of IRA, a do deal, and your traditional boat? Well, I think when you're dealing with a brokerage and they are licensed by the SEC and they're licensed, it's like a six or 67 or a series seven license. And those licenses preclude them from um, investing or, or advising their uh, clients on tradition or non-traditional assets, on, on alternative assets. So they're not really allowed to do that. In fact, there was a time when I was looking at getting my Series uh, 7 license, and I also had a real estate license. And I realized at that time that I would have to give up my real estate license in order to have a Series 7. They were, you know, exclusive of one another. So I think that's the reason. I think that people the, who are um, financial advisors, they just can't advise outside of stock market correlated assets. Okay. So your Trinom World Grudge, they are IRA custodians, but also sell a fraud so they can advise on the products they sell. They hold them themselves, whereas self-directed IRAs are more hands-off, right? They just hold. 
Right. Exactly right. Yeah, we 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 custody the assets. That's that's exactly right. And we don't uh, sell any assets, and we don't tell people what to invest in. So we, that's why it's self directed. What what no in your experience? What do you use a self directed IRA for, if not for stocks and the bottoms? <laughs> I think people like diversity with their uh, with their investing, and so this gives you diversity. The number one asset class, though, uh, for self directed IRA investors is uh, private stock or what you might call private placements, uh, syndications. A lot of different names for the same thing. That's the number one asset class. Also, you could make loans with your IRA. Like my IRA, if say you're opening a business, my IRA can lend you money and lend your business money. And then your business would either uh, pay the loan back to me or if I, if my IRA was an equity investor in your business, then your business would pay me like through a K-1 or a shareholder distribution. So this is actually which I learned of my subject in the IRS is when I started purchasing properties uh, for our own portfolio and borrowing credit money from other everyday people ever done who were investors and they wouldn't invest in real estate, but they are more hands off. They wanted to pass up for more time. Now, by WTL, the professionals that want to invest in real estate and they can invest in other people's projects. Anything from, like you said, if a single family homes to uh, part of building syndications and everything in between. True. Do you, uh, what is a, you know, speaking of which, what is a checkbook account? <laughs> well, a checkbook IRA, I laugh because there are a lot of misunderstandings about it. Um, it you could also more properly call it an IRA owned LLC. So what it is, is a, it's a special purpose LLC. And it, in the, in the um, operating agreement it has special language that describes that its purpose is to be used you know, for IRA investing. And so the IRA will buy 100% of the initial units of that LLC. So that LLC actually becomes an asset of the plan. So the IRA is open with money in it. The IRA buys 100% of the initial units of the LLC, okay? And then in exchange, the IRA sends money into the LLC's checking account, all right? So you've got the IRA as the owner, and then you've got the LLC under the IRA as the asset of the plan. So now if someone has an IRA-owned LLC, also called the checkbook IRA, then they can, just like it implies, write checks. Maybe you're at a uh, an auction and you want to invest in auction properties. So what you would do is you could just write a check right there. Now, you don't always need a checkbook IRA, an IRA-owned LLC, but it's a tool that you can use. Uh, the, I think a frequent misunderstanding about this is that it's sort of a gift with purchase, that if you open a self-directed IRA, the IRA-owned LLC comes with it. And that's not true at all. It's You seek out a third party to create the LLC. The IRA is named as the owner initially. And again, the IRA buys the initial units. And then the IRA funds the checking account at the LLC. So that's how it goes. You said, oh, I understand. Didn't you say that uh, you, you direct does or does not do checkbook accounts? We allow them, yes. We allow them. The account holders do them. We we allow them. Some uh, custodians do not, but we do. Okay. And so what are some of the, I guess, potential pitfalls with self-directed IRAs and with the, uh, the checkbook uh, IRA? That's such a great question. We've been recently, you know, sort of delving into that a little bit more because we like to give our account holders the pro and con of, of, you know, of any situation that they may run into. So the the downside of the LLC is, number one, you pay a lot of money to set it up. You'll pay maybe an attorney to create it. If you're in California, you pay $800 a year to the franchise tax board to keep it. So there's that expense. And... I mean, you may not even need an IRA-owned LLC. So the first thing to think of is, do you really need it? There could be other, you know, filing fees and so forth uh, to consider. Also, these accounts, when you invest with them, 
Well, you don't have the benefit of, of somebody like you, Direct IRA Services, looking at your deals to see if there are what we call prohibited transactions. A prohibited transaction is a real threat to your IRA because it can burst the tax protected bubble uh, and make that, that money taxable. So when we look at someone's investment, we're taking a look not just to make sure that it's vested correctly or that it's an asset that we can custody, but we're also looking to see, is this a prohibited transaction? Because of course, as a business, we don't want to be involved in an account holder's prohibited transaction either. So we're going to, we're going to look at that. Now, if you're using the IRA owned LLC, you don't have the benefit of our uh, view to the, to the transaction. You know, so you don't have that third party review on the deal. Uh, So that, that can be a problem. And it's come up before I, one time I was in talking to this couple and they were talking about investing their IRAs. Each of them, the husband and wife each had an IRA. Each IRA had its own LLC, which was a good way to structure it. But then what they wanted to do is come together and invest in a building, which normally is fine. But it turns out this building, was adjacent next door to an asset to a building they already own. And so it's a prohibited transaction. It's kind of convoluted here, but but they would be receiving personal benefits. And think about it like this. If you own building A and building B is sitting next to it, if building B sells, that's going to affect the value of building A, right? And so that, that would give the IRA holder a personal benefit. So they would their personal property would increase in value from this sale in this case. And so they would personally benefit from their IRA. And that is technically a prohibited transaction. Okay. That's how subtle prohibited transactions can be, which is why we offer a 20 minute consultation or however long it takes really to talk to people about their deals and find out what they're doing, what their intentions are, talk about the assets, who are the investors. So we can weed out, is this a prohibited transaction? Now, if you have an IRA-owned LLC, no one's having that conversation with you. And you can go ahead and, and make a transaction that could uh, that could blow the tax-protected bubble of your account. So that's a, that's a downside to the IRA-owned LLC. Plus, the IRS just received something like $80 billion. Uh, and they have more, uh, what do you call them, uh, auditors out on the streets. And so your IRA owned LLC is low hanging fruit because the IRS understands that there's probably a prohibited transaction in this LLC. A lot of people don't know how to properly uh, keep the books on an IRA owned LLC. For example, you can't use that money for personal use at all. So maybe your IRA owned LLC owns a house and you think, well, I'm going to go drive to that house and that house is an asset in my in my LLC. So I'm going to use the debit card for my IRA owned LLC to pay for gas to get to that house. And but that is but then you're having personal use of your of your funds and that's a prohibited transaction. So it, it's easy to commit a prohibited transaction in one of these. So what are some of these other uh, I don't know, limitations on prohibited transactions? Um we do, you know, residential properties, single family, small multifamily. Or we do wood bank for suppers and turn them into short term rentals. Uh, could we swing the hammer on these things, pay the bills for these things? Or um, if we're in, say, it's on a state, if we're in that. No town can stay in our own. <laughs> no, no, there, there are, there are definite rules, and I call it a game of keep away. You know, because to to prevent a prohibited transaction, you keep away from certain things, and one is um, having any personal use of the IRA owned asset. So, if your IRA owned a property, you would never stay in there. Neither would any of your Ascendants or descendants, any disallowed people, we should talk about that. So the people who are disallowed to the IRA are your ascendants and descendants, parents and grandparents, you and your spouse, children and grandchildren, plus anyone who is a fiduciary to the deal or a 50-50 business partner. So those people, hands away, keep away from those people with your IRA, they self-directed deals. 
So if your IRA owns a house, none of those people are going to have use of that property. That would be a prohibited transaction. And you said, can you swing the hammers? No, you can't because you cannot, uh, you cannot um, provide good services or facilities to the plan. And so, and that's also called an over contribution of sweat equity. So you hire third party vendors to do the work for your IRA owned assets and you don't do it yourself. But I'll mention though, when it comes to property management, now you talked about short term rentals or even, you know, midterm or long term rentals. Property management is a really good idea. It helps you keep arms length. But what you can do as an IRA owner is you can pick up and collect the rent checks. You can hire third party vendors to do the work. Uh, but you can go ahead and screen the property, you know, and, and, and decide that's a property you want. You can talk to the renters and make sure those are renters that you want. But still, you keep it arm's length. So in some ways, you can property manage your IRA owned property. But you just keep arm's length from, you know, offering services to the plan, I would say. Uh, and one thing you never, never do is take a fee to be a property manager to your IRA owned property. That would be a big no-no. Got it. And so as far as you explained here, uh, self-directed IRA custodians, they can advise on whether you know, a transaction purchase is prohibited or not. They won't advise on whether it's a good investment or not. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, what we advise about, if okay, like, I guess to put it this way, whether or not an IRA holder commits a prohibited transaction is entirely their responsibility. So we don't take responsibility for that because it's self-directed and they're making these decisions and we can't control the decisions that they make. But we do, you know, talk to them and say and tell and teach them this is a this is a prohibited transaction. And if we see one in their transaction, we will make them aware of it. But whether or not they commit a prohibited transaction is is their own responsibility. How does one uh, open open one of these uh, these self directed accounts? Can you roll over from a more traditional account and do the assets in you know some author traditional IRA come along with it? Do you have to liquidate before uh, rolling over the finances? Yes. How does that work? Yeah, that's that's a frequently asked question. It really is. So. Opening an account is very easy. You fill it a digital form on our website. Very simple. But moving the money into it, um, you can do that in three ways. So you could contribute to an account. And doing that depends upon the account. It depends upon the account type, uh, your age, and how much money you make, your income. Those are all factors determining your contribution limit. But you could contribute from your own checkbook. There's a cap every year. You could transfer from one IRA to another IRA, and that's very easy to do. You fill out a form. We have that online. And if you want to move over a previous employer plan, that's a little different. That's called a roll-up. So you open your account, so you have a, a bucket to hold that money. Then you contact the previous employer's plan administrator. And the plan administrator will then issue usually a check made payable to your IRA account or solo key account, whatever it happens to be. And they will move the money over from the uh, previous 401k or employer plan into the IRA like that. It takes a little longer, but it's either contribution, rollover, or transfer. How long does the process take? The whole process, uh, the fastest it's ever gone from anyone I've ever talked to in the industry, and I've been in the industry 17 years, the fastest from Opening an account to fund a deal is four days. And that is, that is lands, that is crazy fast. Typically, we're waiting on uh, the third party administrator to move the money from one account to another. And because of that delay, it can take up to two weeks to get from an opened account to a funded deal within a self directed IRA. And that's usually if it's all in dollars. Or are you talking also the the paper assets? I think um, I'm not I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but but it it does um, yeah. So it it's just from from soup to nuts, you know, from opening the account, getting it funded, and then the investment process. You can expect two weeks. 
for sure. One of the one of the things that I saw in the list of the, uh, things you can invest investments you can you know invest with and self directed IRAs. I don't know what made that a mouthful, but uh, it was gold bullion. And this isn't like a gold uh, index fund or mutual fund. Can you, you, you can buy assets, but do you, hold, as the custodian, hold the bullion? And, or how, do, how does that work? Yeah, a lot of misunderstanding in this area. So glad you're bringing it up because, yes, an IRA can invest in physical gold not certificated gold, not gold stocks necessarily, but the actual metal itself. And so what the way you do that is you open an account and fund it. You find a gold dealer. They will give us a, like an invoice. We pay that invoice and we have them, you know, agree, you know, and sign documentation promising to ship the gold. And then they'll ship the gold to, we, we use a third party uh, company, typically Delaware Depository. They're also a trust company but their primary job is holding precious metals, a little mini Fort Knox, if you will. So we have a third party hold those uh, coins or, or bars or whatever it may be. Now, they're not numismatics, which is collectibles. The metals in a self-directed IRA could be silver, gold, palladium, platinum. It has to have a very, very high degree of purity. And then it qualifies to go into an IRA. For example, a Krugerrand, doesn't have a high enough degree of purity to go into an IRA, but like a maple leaf or a, a, a Liberty Corp, it does. So it's like 9.9999 fineness, very, very, very high. But yes, I, I, I love, I, I, <laughs> my friends at Delaware Depository call me a silver stacker. That's something that, that I like to invest in. And it's, it's one asset class and a way to diversify given all the assets that there are out there. So all of those uh, gold dealers you hear about and advertisers where they say, contact, to, contact us now for the you know, open your gold bearing IRA. They're talking about a self-directed IRA. Yes, a gold IRA. Selling yeah. their gold. Yeah. It, it means it, it's an, an IRA, a self-directed IRA holds alternative assets. So that's absolutely what they mean. And I would just pay attention to the fine print. And, and look at the fees. And also, I would say that if you're investing in precious metals, what you want to do is look at the spot price versus what they're charging you. Um, and also Google it and, and do your due diligence on the metals dealer. Um, t- find out about if they've ever had any legal issues. On any asset, you want to do your due diligence, just like precious. Uh, frankly, I'm more, more interested in real estate. Okay, me too. <laughs> Oh, uh, but that was, that was something I was curious about. Uh, tell me, what am I missing here? Um, what is it else about self-directed IRAs should it, uh, our audience know? I think that, I mean, why self-direct, right? Why do this? And to me, the reason, especially where we'll talk about real estate as an asset, Say, for example, you buy a property for $100,000. I mean, we used to be able to do that, right? <laughs> but just to use a number. And then you, your IRA keeps it and your IRA pays us all the expenses of that asset. Your IRA collects the proceeds, maybe the rental income from that asset. And years go by and, you know, paying the expenses, receiving the income. And then at some point, there's a liquidity event and you sell it. Well, all that money, whenever, whatever asset it is, whenever you sell an asset, all that money goes back into the IRA account. It's not diminished by tax. And so you can compound faster because then you can take all that money, not diminished by tax, and put it into the next deal. And then it will, con- it will continue to compound year after year. And in this way, you can have a better retirement, again, because of the benefits of compounding your, your returns. That reminds me, too, is that we were talking about prohibited transactions. When you, you can have a uh, personal benefit from the use or of or basically direct contact with the the property. However, you can you can use your 
it's up to like IRA to purchase, say, a fraction of a, a property. But you could have the whole family invest or multiple you know, people invest with all of their individual self-directed IRAs. How, how do you get the, the whole family in to, <laughs> say, a purchase? Well, you bring up two thoughts in my mind. One is uh, when you're raising capital from a large group, that might be considered a syndication. So I would make sure that you're not getting into that that gray area of of having to create like a reg D, reg C, reg A, B, or C, A, B, C, or D offering, I should say. So make sure that you're safe there. But when pe- families dis- can be disallowed, now your cousins and your aunts and uncles, your brothers and sisters, they're okay. They're They're allowed parties. But say, for example, it's your, it's your, it's your wife, it's your parents that are also included and they all want to invest in a deal. You actually can do that. That's a loophole as long as you invest concurrent. So everybody, you know, would, would in this family, their ownership to the, to the asset would, you know, record, say it's real estate would record on title concurrent. That's a loop. So after you do that, though, nobody could buy each other out. And any disallowed parties couldn't buy each other out. All expenses are split pro rata, same thing, all proceeds. But think about this. It, it can be complex when you have a large group of people invest in one asset because say there's a property tax bill. Maybe you have five people in the deal. Five people are going to be paying that property tax bill, either through their, either five IRAs or five individuals or some contra, you know, a combination of them. So just, you know, consider the whole situation uh, before you do that and, and really think about how you want to structure that deal. But it's doable. You can do it. Excellent advice. Thank you. Now, besides purchasing a, you know, residential or commercial properties, there are many other ways to buy, go invest in real estate besides that. So I, I make it a little brawl my own. Uh, also, like I mentioned earlier, uh, notes and personal and, and mortgages loans. Um, can you can you explain a little bit more about the different options one has in investing in real estate with our self-directed IRA? Right. Well, I think almost all self-directed, the, the vast majority of self-directed IRA investors invest in an asset that's somehow tied to real estate, except for maybe precious metals or cryptocurrency. Um, Either, like you say, it's either a note tied to real estate a lot of times, or it's either commercial or residential real estate or raw land. And, and it's just, it's just the top level of alternative assets. Um, Raw land, for example, your IRA can invest in a piece of raw land. Then you're going to have maybe expenses. So, you have to consider that. So if the IRA is invested in a piece of raw land, you might have to pay, of course, property tax or pay to have it weeded or cared for in some way. But you can also earn income in ways you might not have thought of, like renting it out to farmers to graze cattle, um, leasing it to somebody to put uh, one of those big turbine uh, wind, you know, air, uh, windmills on it to, to generate electricity. Uh, there are different ways you could possibly lease out raw land. Your IRA could do that and make, and make money. Um, your IRA could invest in a syndication that maybe owns a multifamily building. And so it's your IRA indirectly investing in real estate through the, you know, the, the vehicle of a syndication. And then your IRA has a partial uh, ownership interest in maybe, maybe a large building. So those, those are some of the ways or, or buy a property directly. It seems like you can be very creative if you want to with yes. your self directed IRA. Yes, I think so. Uh, you mentioned uh, you, you've been in the business uh, a while. I, what I tried to do to uh, self directed IRA you know, field didn't. I think I read, I mean, it was on your website, you started or, yeah, and losing draft reporting. Yeah. Yeah. I was in radio for, for a long time, for 17 years. And uh, that's how long I've been subdirected IRAs too, by the way. Uh, but yeah, I, I started off in college. I was in the, on the college radio station and then went on to um, be a radio announcer in several different cities until I realized I wanted to make an actual income. You know, like some 
and, and prosper. And, and uh, so I, of course, like a lot of people, I, I went from what I was doing into real estate because I could see the amazing benefits of being a real estate investor and owning property. It was, it's, it's enormous. It's such a great way to personal wealth. And so my entire life shifted away from uh, broadcasting into, into real estate in different functions and, you know, mortgage loan servicing, loan origination. Uh, I was a property manager. And now I'm a real estate investor along with everything else I do. Well, that's, that's definitely a course correction, a transition. But uh, uh, I'm certainly grateful for your time, your uh, knowledge, and your expertise in sharing with our audience. Um, where can um, my audience uh, go to find out more about you, you right, and possibly open their, their own software to buy right? We're all over social media, uh, but I think probably the best place to find us is on our website because we have so much information there. We have a really great blog with hundreds of articles about really any question that you can think of with self-directed IRAs. And the, the address for that is uh, the letter U, udirectira.com. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anything I missed, anything else you'd like to share? I, there's always little, some little nuances on the horizon for self-directed IRAs. First off, I would say that um, I belong to the read of the Retirement Industry Trust Association. It's our industry group. And, and so I've got my ear to the ground as far as what's happening in Washington. And I just say that there's a lot of bipartisan support for retirement plans. And so both sides of the House uh, seem to really, and, and Senate, seem to really like people saving for retirement. So these accounts appear to be safe, which is people will always ask me that question. And, and so no red flags there. But one thing that came up at the end of 2022, Secure Act 2.0 passed. And when it did, it said that we can make Roth type contributions to um, SEP IRAs and simple IRAs. Like, wow, that's like a SEP IRA has a max contribution, like a cap of $69,000 a year. Now you have to qualify for it and you want to, you know, learn more about it. But imagine being able to contribute $69,000 to a SEP IRA as Roth money and let the proceeds from those dollars grow tax-free for life. That's wonderful. Now, the catch is that since the end of 2022, the Department of Treasury has given us no guidance. <laughs> How do we do this? What are the rules? What are... You know, if we do this, can we do that? I mean, we need guidance and we still don't have it. But be on the lookout. That's on the horizon. Pretty soon, we're going to get some guidance uh, from the Department of Treasury, which the IRS is under, about how to make these contributions to uh, these types of retirement accounts. So that's very exciting. Well, that's actually incredible news. Um, it also reminds me, too, besides the self directed IRA, what types of uh, or arrangements do are you going to what what can you create i see yeah it's it's a traditional uh, ira a roth uh, which is uh the, the roth is the one that's tax-free uh, a SEP ira a simplified employee pension a simple ira which isn't simple it's a savings incentive match plan for employers it's an acronym <laughs> um it could be an inherited ira if someone passes away you inherit their ira it could be a spousal IRA too. If you're a non-working spouse, uh, but your spouse has a job, you can still contribute to an, an IRA because normally you can't contribute to an IRA unless you have your own earned income. But with a spousal IRA, then you can contribute. It's not so. That's how that works. Um, then there's also, for example, the solo 401k. That's a 401k for an individual business owner who has no employees in any of the companies that they own, and they can have this special account that has a lot of Really good advantages, like being able to make Roth contributions to them. That's one of the advantages and higher contribution. So there's an entire alternate world of retirement accounts available to those who are looking to expand that doesn't beyond what the brokerage houses offer. I really appreciate you going on and uh, educating us. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Carl, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.